Well, thank you, everybody, and thank you for coming. Um, I'm really pleased to see so much interest. That's great. Um, and please do call me Julia. I've got too many titles. My family just sort of, you know, just say it's ridiculous. So I'm sorry, because the beginning of this is going to be a lot of history. But the reason it's going to be a lot of history is, in order to understand what anti-Semitism is, you need to know a bit of history. So I'm also going to start with just reading you the very, very beginning of the book. So you need to know that I am really old. I'm definitely more than twice the age of most of the people in this room. And I was born in London, about a mile and a half from here. And I'm a real old Londoner. And I grew up in London, and I never experienced any anti-Semitism. Never. Really important. And I'm nearly 70, OK? So you need to get that picture in your heads. This is new. I mean, it's not new. It's always been there on the far right. But it's new to have it in public discourse. So that is the reason I got so angry. So I'm just going to read you a bit, just so you've got a picture of what it was like when I was little. When I was a child growing up in North London, we didn't talk about anti-Semitism. If it came up in conversation, it would likely have been in jest, driving us around in our shabby Ford Popular. None of you will know what that is. Very ancient sort of car, fell to bits a lot. My father enjoyed declaring that the traffic lights, when they were red one after the other, were anti-Semitic. But that was it. And yet, my father's grandmother, Carolina Ellen, had been deported from where she'd sought refuge from Nazi persecution in Germany. She went to Amsterdam, and she was deported from there to Westerbork and on to Sobibor, where she was murdered in May 1943. On the other side of my family, most of my mother's family were murdered, and yet 10 or 15 years later than that, anti-Semitism was about, about traffic lights. It was almost a joke. If Jews felt threatened by anti-Semitism in 1950s or 1960s Britain, we certainly weren't aware of it. OK, I say that because I think it's important that you know that it feels for me, who's lived most of my life in this country, sometimes in America, but mostly in this country, um, that this is something new that we're experiencing in public discourse. So let me give you a bit of history, because I think you do need to get a bit of history to understand this. So people say, oh, well, it started with Christianity. No, it didn't. It started with an Egyptian priest, at least it may not, the first record we have is an Egyptian priest, third century, what I would say BCE, BC, and he wrote scathingly about Jews, and Alexandria, where he was based in Egypt, was then home to the largest diaspora Jewish population in the world. So this is well before the beginnings of Christianity. Then you get, for those of you who ever read the Book of Maccabees, I'm not going to test you on your Bible and apocryphal knowledge, you'll be glad to know, you get a guy called, who's Greek, called Antiochus IV Epiphanes. I bet you know a lot about him. Anyway, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, who was a Seleucid Greek, so Syrian Greek, um, he was a real persecutor of the Jews. And you get the story of that in the Book of Maccabees. And then you get it in Christianity. So it's really important because there's a lot of stuff that's around in history books. And if you look at Wikipedia and so on, there's a lot of stuff that says it started with the Christian church. No, it didn't. It predates the Christian church. And it's really important that people understand that. And it may, may well be that the Christian church picked it up from the Seleucid Greeks and from the Egyptians. We just don't know. Anyway, you certainly got plenty in the Christian church. And you get it very early on. You get bits of it in the Gospels, particularly from Paul, who was, of course, Jewish, which makes it even more complicated. And you get it in what we call the Church Fathers, so that people like Justin Martyr, there's people like Augustine, St. Augustine. And they really, really go for the Jews. And I was going to read you a little bit, so you would just get the feel of this. Here is Augustine in his Confessions. He wrote roughly, probably around the year 400, something like that, 400 CE, AD. Here's Augustine on the Jews. How hateful to me are the enemies of your scripture. How I wish that you would slay the Jews with your two-edged sword 
so that there should be none to oppose your word. Gladly would I have them die to themselves and live to you. In other words, if they converted, they were okay, but otherwise, absolutely not. What was all that about? So very early in the history of Christianity, the view came about that the, Christ that the Jews were responsible for the death of Jesus, so Christ killers. And you will see that frequently. If you, if you go on Twitter or you look at Facebook and you look at some of the anti-Semitism stuff, as, as, as you know, I'm very old, so I don't really do a lot of social media, but writing the book, I had to do a lot of social media. And if you go onto social media platforms, you will still see quite a lot of stuff about Jews as Christ killers. Now, most of the people who are writing that are not Christian, but they have picked it up from what is originally a Christian discourse, from actually the relatively early church, from Augustine and other people like that. And this carried on right through the early Middle Ages into the high, what we call the high Middle Ages. And when you get to the year 1215, you get the Catholic Church coming out with what was known as the Fourth Lateran Council, which forced Jews to wear a special badge. People think Hitler was responsible for the Yellow Star. Not a bit of it. It goes back to 1215, and it goes back to an idea that it was very important that people knew who was Jewish so that they didn't have sex with them, they didn't marry them, they didn't necessarily employ them, and Jews were not allowed to be members of the guilds, which is how you got into the professions or into the crafts. And of course, gradually, Jewish life as a result of that, so this is the, if you like, the power of the Catholic Church at the time. From there, Jews were not allowed to go into most professions. So what did Jews mostly do? And people, of course, talk about Jews as moneylenders, and the expression to Jew somebody is a derogatory term, but it means to be very mean, to do a very sharp deal with somebody. Where does that come from? It comes from the fact that from 1215 onwards, in most of Europe, Jews were not able to do anything other than two main professions. One was actually being um, running a pub, being publicans, innkeepers, uh, and the other, if they weren't peddlers, very small-time tradesmen, was actually to be moneylenders. And that's actually the explanation of why so many Jews eventually ended up being bankers, modern-day bankers, and why so many of modern-day banks have Jewish origins, and my own family on one side. On the other side, they were wine growers in southern Germany, but on one side, they were bankers in Frankfurt, and they came to London in 1906 uh, because they were going to expand the bank and have a British branch. Bank's long gone. Wish it hadn't, but it's long gone. But um, that's a very typical thing because Jews were restricted from what they, you know, in what they could do. So actually, if you look at English Jewish history, you will see lots of Jewish peddlers. They were known as 2% merchants because they used in the 18th century to go to the ports in those days. Plymouth, Exeter was a port. Uh, they went to uh, Brighton, Bournemouth, all the ports. And as the boats came in with whatever goods came in, they would buy them and sell them on at 2%. And so they were known as the 2% merchants. But you need to know that the history of this goes back to the Middle Ages and the general restriction on what Jews could do. So that was quite bad anyway. I mean, the, the 12th and 13th centuries were not good for the Jews. Because the other thing that happened, which was in this country, was, that what ha was the blood libel. I don't know whether people here know about the blood libel, but the blood libel occurred in 1144 when a child, a little boy called William, went missing in Norwich in East Anglia. And he was eventually found dead. And the accusation was made that the Jews had, had captured him and killed him to use his blood in the making of unleavened bread for Passover. And it, that blood libel, so you got that in 1144, and 15 years later you got it again. This time it was Hugh of Lincoln, another little boy who disappeared and was found dead. And the result of that was the common belief, not saying that the rulers believed it, that educated people believed it, but the common belief in this country was that Jews were using the blood of Christian children to make unleavened bread for Passover. And you've got to draw a parallel, for those of you who are Christian and, and, and know about communion, you've got to draw a parallel with, of course, 
the significance of blood and wine. And in communion, the wine symbolizes the blood of Christ. So this is a very deliberate libel, and it caused huge trouble. And it was always around the period of Passover, which is usually parallel with Easter, and so commonly all around Europe, but particularly in this country, there were demonstrations <coughs> and riots against the Jews around Easter. And in the Passover service, a lot of Jews don't know this, but in the Passover service there is a place where we open the door, theoretically, to let the prophet Elijah come in. But actually it probably goes back to opening the door so that everybody outside can see no Christian children are being killed in order to get blood for the, uh, for the making of unleavened bread of matzah. So it was a really bad time, and Jews were expelled from this country in 1290 and not readmitted till 1656. Okay. Meanwhile, in Germany, where most of my family came from, uh, there were all sorts of things like um, restrictions on how many Jews could marry in particular cities. In Frankfurt, where my father's family came from, only 12 Jewish marriages a year were allowed right up until sort of the 1870s. It's a long, long time. Um, if you go to, to the city of Wittenberg, which isn't very far from Frankfurt, there's still on the cathedral what's known as the Judenzau, which is a kind of the Jews are pigs, particularly I I offensive, obviously, because Jews don't eat pork. And it's a really hideous representation of the, the Jew as a, an evil pig, which gets absolutely everywhere. Loads of this. I could go on forever about it, but that's not the point, except you need to know where it all comes from. And then, if you look at Islam, which has never been anti-Semitic in the same way as Christianity, you get little bits in the Quran, but very little. Where you get much more is in later Muslim teaching, Islamic teaching, in the Hadith, and you particularly get uh, one, one bit which is about killing the Jews, which is now in, as part of the Hamas charter. But actually, if you look at the Quran itself, there's very little. There's a kind of strange thing about a particular tree, and that which was seen, it was seen as kind of a Jewish tree. But essentially, in the way that the Quran is framed and in the way that Muhammad was teaching, it looks as if he regarded Jews and Christians and Muslims as essentially what we now call people of the book, and that they all had a right to a peaceful life. And it starts off with different tribes and it becomes a, a, a Jews and Christians and Muslims. So it's quite, I mean, it's quite interesting that the, the, the slant, the historical slant of anti-Semitism is largely, but not wholly, comes from Christianity. That doesn't mean that you don't get plenty in modern uh, Islamic thought. You particularly get it from some Muslim leaders, and the classic example is Mahathir Muhammad, Muhammad of Malaysia, who has been pretty vicious in some of the things that he has said. And I'll read you one of those because it's probably worth you hearing it. Um, but I think it is important, I think it's important for people to hear that most, because people don't see it, most modern anti-Semitism probably has its origins largely in Christianity and in fake anthropology. And Islam and Muslim societies were not historically particularly anti-Semitic. So, Apart from anything else, Mahathir Muhammad says that the term anti-Semitism was invented to stop people criticizing the Jews, which is a bit of a kind of strange way of thinking, but anyway. Uh, but he does, in 2013, he appeared to urge people to wipe out the Jews at an organization of the Islamic Conference Summit in Kuala Lumpur, and here's what he, say. he says. There must be a way, and we can only find a way if we stop to think, to assess our weaknesses and our strengths, to plan, to strategize, and then to counter-attack. We are actually very strong. 1.3 billion people cannot simply be wiped out. The Europeans killed 6 million Jews out of 12 million. In other words, it must be possible to get rid of the lot. So not very attractive. And there are various other leaders, relatively modern Muslim leaders that you can quote uh, the leader of Hamas, al Rantisi, is one of them, and I could give you some other examples. But essentially what I'm saying is if you want to look at the history of anti-Semitism, the bulk of it, although it doesn't start with Christianity, the bulk of it lies in the church and particularly in the Middle Ages. And then it changes. 
people start getting less religious, particularly Christians in Europe start getting less religious, particularly in the 19th century. So despite this huge building, you know, go around London, look how many 19th century churches there are. But despite that, actually people were beginning to be less religious. They were going to church less. So anti-Semitism morphed. And it morphed particularly in Germany. And it morphed with a, a journalist called Wilhelm Marr, quite a distinguished journalist, who invented the term antisemitismus and who basically uh, started saying that it wasn't so much that Jews were Christ killers, he wasn't very interested in that, but that they were an inferior people. And this is the period of the growth of, I suppose, modern anthropology and what we would now regard as completely fake anthropology with the idea that you could judge people by the size of their skulls and the shape of their skulls. So everybody, people are nodding away, so you know something about this. Okay, that you can look at peoples and you can say that they're superior or inferior peoples. This is a time of great colonialism, British colonialists, German colonialists, French colonialists. The native peoples were racially inferior. Jews become seen as racially inferior. They have different shaped skulls. And there's a French anthropologist, he's actually one of the worst, Vacher de la Pouge, don't recommend reading, he's awful. Um, but he regards people as categorizable into sort of, as it were, three levels. Really superior, top class uh, <coughs> racially, so Aryan or whatever. Then middle, not too bad really, but not really kind of the ones who ought to associate with us. And then the ones at the bottom who are the really inferior. And those are the so-called native peoples of, you know, be it of India, of Africa, uh, of wherever, wherever there was colonial power, and the Jews. And this started really in the 1870s. There was a, a Prussian politician, von Treitschke, who took, to, took it up in a big way, and it becomes a big deal. And there were very distinguished British anthropologists who followed this line. So it's particularly somebody called Galton, who was a very well-known, very highly respected <coughs> scientist who you know, swallowed the lot. And actually, until after the Second World War, it was perfectly respectable to, to, to talk about all sorts of different races and racial characteristics and so on. And of course, now we're very clear, there is one human race. We may come in different shapes and forms, different sizes, whatever, different colors, and we may have particular ethnic characteristics because of our genetic uh, makeup, but we don't talk any longer, and rightly not, about different races. But it actually took the Holocaust to bring that about, because the racial theory that comes from the 1870s and goes right the way through to the 1940s, it took the Holocaust to really explode that. And it's not acceptable now, but you can still see lots of it if you want to have a look. And what's even weirder is when you look at the expression anti-Semitism, what, if, if you've got anti-Semitism, there must be Semitism. But what is Semitism? Well, it doesn't exist, because languages were Semitic languages. We developed languages as Indo-Aryan languages, Semitic languages. I, I read Semitic languages at Cambridge when I was a student. But it isn't about people. You can't have Semitic peoples. It's nonsense. And so the whole expression is based on something that doesn't exist. Anti-Semitism implies Semitism. There is no such thing. So the whole thing becomes really weird. And then you get Nazi Germany, and everybody knows what happened there, and the Holocaust. And then you get the real rise of white supremacism, <coughs> and that's particularly in the United States, but in a whole lot of other countries as well. And you get, people will know about the rally in Charlottesville a few years ago, where you get the cry, the Jews will not replace us. And actually, white supremacism has been really ghastly for Jews and Muslims in the United States. <coughs> and there are bits of it in this country and around Europe, but it's not like it is in the United States. But it is serious, and it's serious on the right. And so people say, well, OK, what are we going to do about all this? This is all getting a bit out of hand, and we're seeing uh, anti-Semitism around the place, and certainly for those of us in this country, the first time we really saw it widespread was after, after 2016. It was actually after Jeremy Corbyn became leader of the Labour Party. 
And it was as if, it's not that he just said, right, anti-Semitism's okay now, of course not. And he would claim he's a complete anti-racist and it's not acceptable. But somehow, him coming to be leader of the Labour Party licensed it. So it was there on the far right. It's always there on the far right. We've always had it. But we hadn't seen it much on the far left. Bits of it, certainly when I was much younger, we saw bits of it in militant. But actually, it, we saw much more of it when it came to Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. And I'm not saying that he was the person who encouraged it. What I am saying is that he, that a lot of new people joined the Labour Party and they expressed it and he didn't stamp down on it. He didn't stamp down on it quickly enough. And it's really horrific. And there's been a huge row. You'll all be aware of the huge row. And I think very many of us were deeply disturbed. I mean, I certainly had never experienced anything like it. We were seeing it in the Labour Party. We were seeing it, bits of it, going into common speech. And many of us were appalled. And I've never known the Jewish community agree on anything. They never do. Two, two Jews, three opinions isn't a joke. It's a fact. So for the Jews to actually go and demonstrate on Parliament Square is just bizarre. But there they were, out on Parliament Square. And I have to say, by no means only Jews. I walked over from the House of Lords with a group of Labour peers, most of whom were not Jewish, who were just as appalled as I was. But it was a demonstration that was organised by the Jewish community. It's, the expression was dayenu, it's a Hebrew word, which means it's enough. And we were joined by a lot of Muslims, we were joined by a lot of politicians from other parties who were not Jewish, but it was a Jewish demonstration. Enough. We're not used to this, it's really vile, we don't like it, etc. And at the same time, people are saying, well, what is anti-Semitism? We don't know what it is. And then you get the IHRA definition. I haven't got time to go into that, but that's an agreed now international definition of anti-Semitism. It isn't ideal. Everybody knows it isn't ideal, but it's what we've got for the moment until somebody decides to, if you like, uh, do something really difficult and upset everybody and try and revise it. It's not ideal, but it is a definition. And then you get this. I'm not an anti-Semite. I'm an anti-Zionist. And what does that mean? Well, it can mean a variety of things. But let me try and unpick it, because it's really important. And it's particularly important on the hard left. If you're somebody who says, I criticise the policies of the State of Israel, that's me too. I'm always criticising the policies of the State of Israel. I chair an, uh, an institution, the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute in Israel, and a lot of people who work there are always criticising the policies of the State of Israel. That's fine. Less fine is to say the State of Israel has no right to exist. What does that mean? Are we going to say that India has no right to exist? 1948? Is that what we're going to say? It was a, I mean, whether we like it or not, it was agreed that it should exist, and it has existed since 1948. So I think saying that Israel has no right to exist is a bit difficult, and that is in no way underplaying the suffering and the horrors that Palestinian peoples have experienced, which they have. And the Israelis have dealt with that, on the whole, very badly. Okay? So let's just lay that on the line. But nevertheless, saying the State of Israel doesn't have a right to exist is problematic. It would have been perfectly possible to say you didn't want the State of Israel to exist if it had been in the 1920s or 1917 with the Balfour Declaration. That's fine. You didn't want it originally to exist. You weren't a Zionist before the State of Israel existed fine. Lots of the Jewish community in this country didn't want the State of Israel to exist. But the fact is it does. So if you say you're an anti-Zionist and mean, I don't think the State of Israel should exist, I think you've got a problem. And the other problem is where, and this is common, people criticise the State of Israel in fairly vicious terms. It's pretty strong stuff, but they don't criticise anywhere else. And actually, I think if you don't criticise China, for its treatment of a million Uyghur Muslims who are in re-education camps, so-called, or Myanmar, Burma, for its treatment of Rohingya Muslims, or India for its treatment of Christians, and Pakistan for its treatment of Christians. If you don't do any of those, but you only criticise Israel, and only in very extreme terms, I think you've got a bit of a problem. It may only be a perspective problem, 
but it isn't great. It's not the same as the anti-Semitism that says that Jews are inferior. It's not the same as the saying that Jews are Christ killers, but it's a problem, and I think it's worth stating that. So let me then come on to where I think we are now and why I think it's so serious, because I wrote the book because I was so furious. I can lose my rag a bit. So why I'm really, really gobsmacked by all this is that a lot of present anti-Semitism on the hard left has its roots probably in something called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. I don't know whether people know about that. It was written in about 1903, we're not absolutely sure. It was written by a uh, strongly Russian Orthodox guy who was an advisor to the Tsar, uh, somebody called Nilus, and it claimed that there is a world Jewish conspiracy working out how to control, obviously, the world, and to make everybody else, if you like, less well off. So the whole idea, the sort of the racial thing is then turned on its head because originally Jews were seen as an inferior race by the anthropologists. And now you've got this world Jewish conspiracy saying Jews are superior and they're going to kind of have a go at everybody else. 1903. It was the Times of London that exposed it as a fraud in 1921. And yet it continued to circulate widely. Henry Ford, Ford cars, my father drove a Ford Popular. Uh, Henry Ford bought loads of copies and circulated it to loads of people. It was, a, it was hugely popular, particularly in the United States, but it was widely circulated everywhere. And you can see plenty of it now if you look on Twitter and Facebook. Sorry, but you can. And the thing about that is, slightly bizarrely, although it was shown to be a fraud, it became extremely popular in Russia. So it starts in 1903, it's exposed as a fraud in 1921, come the Russian Revolution, it becomes really popular again, and the communists pick it up, and in the late 1940s and the early 1950s, there's something called the doctor's plot. I don't know whether you know about that, but it's a plot. Stalin argues that all these doctors, particularly most of them were Jewish, not all, all these doctors are enemies of the state, and they're you know, plotting to overthrow the state, <laughs> So it's like the protocols of the elders of Tsar, and these are people who are too powerful, they shouldn't be allowed, etc. They all shifted from their jobs, and some of them were killed. Interestingly, that all stopped when Stalin died. And within two weeks, the Russian authorities, the Soviet authorities said, no, 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 it's absolute rubbish, and everybody was, well, such as of them were still alive and okay, were restored to their jobs. But what seems to be the case is that this thinking behind the doctor's plot which probably has its origins in the protocols of the elders of Zion, who could be sure, seems to have found its way into the hard left. So it's a Stalinist bit of ideology. So Jews are too powerful. Hence all this stuff about Jews control the media. They don't. Hence all the stuff about Jews control the money. They don't. Hence the idea that somehow Israel is you know, supported entirely by you know, a world Jewish conspiracy, not true, etc., etc. But it's really important that we understand that the origins of some of that do come probably from the protocols of the Elder Zazan. And so we've had a lot of stuff that's pretty depressing. You've done the history, that's it. You'll be glad to hear. It's quite a lot of history. But we have had gr real expressions of anti-Semitism around Europe, in the United States, and to some, some extent in this country, although this country is probably the least anti-Semitic country in the Western world. And that's actually really interesting. So insofar as you can judge it with percentages, it's very hard to measure, people say that between 2 and 5% of the population of the UK are actually anti-Semitic. But there's a problem, because there's what's known as the elastic definition of anti-Semitism, so that People who aren't remotely anti-Semitic have picked up some of these anti-Semitic ideas that are floating around in the ether that you see on Twitter all the time. And so they might express one or two anti-Semitic ideas, but they're not really anti-Semitic. So it's quite hard to know how you measure that. But that's what, what we're seeing. And 
Insofar as you can measure it, people who are trying to measure it are saying it's about 30% of the population. So quite high of people who've picked up some of those ideas. Compared with France, compared with Germany, with the rise of the AfD, the alternative for Deutschland, and so on, this is quite low. And in Britain, we've had precious little violence compared, for instance, with attacks in Toulouse, in Paris, uh, on the Day of Atonement, in Halle, in Germany, and various other attacks. There's been Copenhagen, there's been Brussels, etc., etc. But it isn't great. It's just less ghastly than in other countries. But there's certainly stuff around in the ether. And that, I think, is the thing that is so important. And then you get the Labour Party. And you get Jeremy Corbyn not able to see what he's talking about. So, for instance, I don't know whether anybody here remembers the uh, mural in East London where the wonderful Muslim mayor of Tower Hamlet said, we've got to scrub this off, look for Rechman, who was criticised for many other things, but not for that. And, uh, but the, but, but um, Jeremy Corbyn couldn't see what was wrong with it. It was a cartoon of sort of so-called archetypal Jews. I mean, clearly not. It's a, it's a, a, a hate figure. Um, men with hooked noses crouching over a Monopoly board. And the Monopoly board is um, placed on the backs of crouching poor people. This is the World Jewish Conspiracy. This could have appeared in Der Sturmer, the Nazi paper. It was really disgusting. And Corbyn originally defended it on grounds of free expression. And you know, the local Muslim community said, to, uh, hang on a minute, that's got to go. But he uh, defended it on freedom of expression. And he couldn't see what was wrong with it. And why couldn't he see what was wrong with it? Well, I can't see into his heart or head. I don't know. But I think he couldn't see what was wrong with it because he couldn't see that it was the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, the Jewish conspiracy, these rich Jews leaning on the backs of the poor. He just couldn't see it. And I think that's what's been so disturbing. There was also, and some of you may remember this, the, uh, the whole question about him uh, talking about Jews having no sense of humor. I'm, I'm, coming, I'm, I'll, I'm taking questions shortly, don't worry. I'm going to be about two more minutes and that's it. There was also the question of him um, saying that English Zionists, code word for Jew, didn't have a sense of irony. And I thought the best reply was by one of the writers of Yes Minister, who said, you know, I'm Jewish, so obviously I don't have a sense of irony. But my co-author was only half Jewish, so maybe he had half a sense of irony. I just thought that was great. Really good reply to all of that. But anyway, he can't hear it, he can't see it because it's in his head and I think that's really important. There are conservatives who have expressed awful anti-Semitic stuff and certainly the support of conservative uh, MEPs for some of the policies of Viktor Orban in Hungary which were anti-Semitic, Islamophobic and completely disgraceful is something that ought to disturb us all. But it's been pretty awful. And it's got to where social media, particularly if you look at Twitter, not my favorite occupation, has huge amounts of criticism and really virulent anti-Semitism against particularly Jewish women Labour MPs. So Margaret Hodge, Ruth Smeath, Luciana Berger all got real rubbish. It was really horrendous, really hateful. What's happened? Well. This is a good news story, actually, in the end. When I wrote the book, I was really hoping that eventually we'd just be able to throw the copies away because it wouldn't be needed anymore. And to some extent in this country, that appears to be the case. The Labour Party, with that particular group in charge, is being investigated by the Equalities and Human Rights Commission for anti-Semitism. But what was interesting, good though that may be, what was interesting were two completely separate things. One was, when this was really at its height, Muslim communities around the country came out to support Jewish communities. Absolutely extraordinary. And they kept on saying, yeah, they'll do it to you, they'll do it to us next. And it was a really, it's really moving. And the one time that uh, we had a, 
it wasn't remotely terrorist, but people thought there was going to be some kind of attack on my synagogue. It was the Middle Eastern supermarket next door that tipped everybody off and then made sure that everybody had some hot drinks. And I think it's really, really important to say that. So that's one thing. And it's made the relationship between, between Jews and Muslims actually much closer, which is terrific. Partly just, you know, dealing with the rest, but that's another matter. And the other thing is that in the election campaign, and the data hasn't been analysed yet, so it's hard to know exactly the extent, but it appears that one of the contributing factors to Labour not winning its heartland seats in the Midlands and the North was anti-Semitism. And it was almost as if, we don't really know necessarily what anti-Semitism anti is, but we know we don't like it. And it made me feel very proud to be British, actually. I thought, great, good on you. And it didn't play well with the electorate. So I think there is a good news story at the end of that. I think the anti-Semitism has been revolting. I think it's out there in the ether. It's certainly there on Twitter and Facebook. I mean, the, you know, in a way that it certainly wasn't when I well, it wasn't Twitter and Facebook when I was younger, but it wasn't around in the ether when I was younger. But there have been some good things that have come out, and amongst those are anti-Semitism doesn't play well with the electorate, and a good thing too. Thanks very much.